Today on Off the Clock, we are going to be talking about something that I know our listeners, or many of them, have been following closely, and that's the recent increase in union organizing. We're going to talk about the latest, uh, the new rules surrounding union elections, and what businesses should consider doing to prepare. Welcome to Off the Clock, the webcast of employment attorneys at Miller Johnson, where we discuss what is happening in the HR world and provide practical insight and advice. We're talking about something today that um, I know I've been talking to clients a lot about. Our labor attorneys here at Miller Johnson have been spending every minute of every day really (laughs) talking to clients about it. So I'm guessing our listeners really want to hear the latest with regard to union organizing. Yeah, uh, we've been talking about it a lot because it's been happening a lot. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> that's yes. why. Uh, it's just in the news constantly with the successful uh, strikes. Uh, you could call it successful, right, with the UAW. Right. I mean, what do you think the impact that has had on other organizing drives? There's been a number of strikes over the over the last Oh, should we say six months, something like that, right? I think the UAW strikes were in the fall. Yeah. Six to nine months. Um, and those, it, so the UAW strikes have been advertised to deliver a 25% wage yeah. increase. Big time. Um, to literally hundreds of thousands of employees. And I know the UAW has really used that as in sort of a, in um, arrow in its quiver in support of its efforts to then organize more workplaces. Um, 25% is, I don't need to say this to you, but that is significant. That gets the attention of any person really, particularly individuals working in a production facility, um, many of whom in today's, with today's inflation are worried about making ends meet, et cetera. Let's so be honest. That's I'd a be mic excited drop. about a 25% yeah. that's, a, that's a mic drop <laughs> yeah, moment. And absolutely. I think really important, I think it's been a long time since uh, the major u- unions have been a- able to talk about delivering a wage increase like that. Yeah. Um, and I think that for as long as really I can remember the – um, when employers think about union organizing and for businesses who um, have uh, a position um, that is not in favor of having a union in their workplace, the assumption has largely been it's not really just about wages. It's right. about we, and there's absolutely some to that some to that and sure, and we'll course. talk about it more. Yeah. Um, there's something to that, of course. It's also about how you treat their employees, whether they feel valued, et cetera. Um, except when it's a twenty five percent increase, <laughs> right? You have to. Really it may think be about just that. about wages. <laughs> right. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not sure you can overcome the promise of that type of increase with. A great culture, right? I uh, I completely agree with you. When it dawns on you that oh, they can afford to pay us twenty five percent more, and they didn't just because we didn't ask collectively, collectively, uh, right? Like it. we we and it certainly outweighs the union dues, right? And a lot of people, are, you know, you have to pay to be in the union most right. of the time, and so people are thinking about is it worth the union dues? When you're talking about a twenty five percent raise, all of a sudden. Right, it starts making dollar and cents. Right, that's right. dollars and cents. That's right. Do it. So let's let's back up a second because I, for our listeners who aren't aware, there has really not just in the last few months, but over the last couple of years, really been a resurgence of union or organizing, um, which had been on the decline for a couple of decades, wow, right. really, in our professional careers for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So just a couple of statistics for you. Um, In 2022, there was a 53% increase in union representation petitions over 2021, which is huge. And then in 2023, we saw another 10% increase on top of that. And listen to this one, though, because this one really surprised me. In 2022, unions won 76% of the elections that were held which is a very high number, and just anecdotally speaking, much higher 
than I would have guessed mm -hmm. or expected, quite frankly. So um, unions have found a new fo foothold and have been successful in a way over the last couple of years um, that they hadn't been. Um, what's contributing to that? There's, yeah. And let me just say, that so, I, there's a number of things. Oh, for sure. There's yes. a confluence of factors that are contributing to it. And it might be different in different industries and in different yes. parts of the country. Yes. And, all of that. I find it absolutely fascinating, Yeah, particularly with organizations like Starbucks. Yeah, I was going to say, here's the first thing, those iconic brands. Those iconic brands, mm -hmm. but also, you know, not manufacturing. Yeah. Change right? the idea of what a union is for Young, most pe people. When, most, mm -hmm. when we go to Starbucks, most of the employees we see, right, are have, on the... Have the tattoos and nose rings. Younger and, side, yeah. right? Uh, extraordinarily... Uh, liberal politics, many of them, not right. all of them, of course, but you just don't, you, you know, you don't think of uh, the old grizzly, you know, when you think of union, you think of kind of, you know, grizzled manufacturing, auto right? manufacturing, all yeah. of that. And that's not the look of the new organizers and the successful campaigns, at least in organizations like Starbucks mm -hmm. and other service organizations. Yeah. I think there's a, a politics, that, that identity politics and tribalism that's come over, we don't have to talk about that for, you know, the polarization, all those kinds of words that everyone talks about. Yeah. But I do think it's part of an identity mm -hmm. of some younger folks, right, to right. be in a union. Yeah. I do. And we haven't seen that in a long time with yeah. younger folks. We see it in I agree with the that. folks kind of aging out of the workforce, but not mm -hmm. with the younger folks in many, many uh, it, uh, decades as it was declining. And now we're seeing right. that. On the upside. Starbucks, so listen to this, uh, just a little statistic for you. So Starbucks organized their first, well, a store of Starbucks was organized <laughs> for the first time in 2021. And I remember yeah. it. And by the way, I can't re believe it's already been a couple of years because I remember it because yeah. I was very surprised. Yeah. I, I, because of the workforce, was. because of Starbucks' yeah. reputation for generally treating their employees very well, right. paying them well. Benefits, great job, right. great oh, benefits, et cetera. Um, now there's 380 stores yeah. that are organized. That's that's mind blowing, to isn't me. it? Yeah. Mind blowing, yes. right? That's a star a store every three days, something like that. <laughs> like, every, every other day is being organized. Yeah. So that whole identity of politics things. If you're in this particular. Uh, group in America and believe politically a certain thing, then you are also going to support unionization. Right. I think that, um, I, I could be wrong about this, these are just my thoughts, but uh, even before COVID, but particularly after COVID, people are searching for connection and community and realize how much they need that. Mm -hmm. And a union, some unions uh, provide that for people. You know, I grew up That's in, a, interesting. That in a union town, a union. in a union neighborhood, friends, relatives, right, all that. And the the, uh, the union hall, right, mm -hmm. was the center of social, political, uh, everything, right? And just the act of organizing brings people together and all working for yeah. uh, so that a concept common is goal. Palatable. Yeah. You know, I think that's an important takeaway for our listeners who might who are with organizations who um, don't want to be unionized because mm -hmm. many employers don't, frankly, probably most don't. Um, that I think it's important for them to hear and be reminded that employees, and again, particularly the younger gen generation, are somehow looking for that sense of community, right. even though there's this tension now with. People also saying they want to work remotely and on their own terms. <laughs> right. But not everyone has that privilege, of not course. Not everyone has like that. Like baristas. Yes, exactly. Like manufacturing so employees, et cetera. People are looking for a sense of community at work. Yeah. It's an important social network. And so how do network. we deliver that? It yeah. is. And a safety net for people, too. People take mm -hmm. care. I mean, that again, not every union is the same, and some are more functional or dysfunctional than others. But uh, when all goes well. Yeah. Right. The union is an important social safety net. So let's people. talk about there are some really recent, more recent developments in organizing that I think are really important for our listeners to hear about um, because it's continuing to expand the mm -hmm. effort. OK, yeah. number one, um, 
the UAW is making a concerted effort to engage in organizing activities in the South and in particular in Alabama. Okay. And they are very public about this. And they are very public about their strategy. Their strategy is to organize the plant in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and they're very public that their intention is to organize that plant, use it as a platform mm -hmm. to then continue their efforts in the South. Um, I looked on the UAW's website yesterday and they had announced that they had 30% of the workers at that plant so far sign authorization wow. cards. Wow. Fast, that's, and that's a strategy that we've never, we've wow. really never seen the UAW be that public about a campaign. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting to me. And then at the same time, um, they just announced a strike at Ford's Kentucky plant, uh, Kentucky truck plant, that's gonna impact 9,000 workers as well. So I'm guessing they're hoping then into in Kentucky to deliver um, a wage increase for those workers, similar to what we saw for the contracts that were included in the strike in the fall. For and the so trip. many manufacturers intentionally set up shop in the South, right? Where yeah. unions were less prevalent. Oh, we've got a lot of we've got a lot of clients who have manufacturing facilities in Michigan and then also in Kentucky and Alabama, et cetera. So if any of um, them are listening to this podcast, understand that there are facilities in the South right now are um, vulnerable in ways to union organizing that mm -hmm. um, they have not been probably for many, many years or ever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that is something that many employers just assume if they have a facility in the South that they don't have to worry about such things. So it's really, really important to understand that. Um, the other thing to understand is um, unions have gotten much more sophisticated in using AI and social media yeah. to engage in communications with employees. I think that is just a fascinating aspect mm -hmm. of this. And we can talk later about what's, how to train supervisors and et cetera. Yeah. But it used to be you could see cards. Like you might not, I mean, people do what they could to not pass them under the nose of how supervisors. How many phone calls has Miller Johnson but you gotten because them. a card was found in a break room, right? Yeah. Like that's the old yeah. school way or of in the knowing. Lot or whatever. Mm -hmm. Car quote unquote cards, union authorization cards are online. Yeah. People can check a box on, on their, their phone. phone. Mm -hmm. It's a different world yeah. when we think about that and all the communications. You know, we have all these policies and we have them about what you can post on <laughs> bulletin boards and all that. Who needs that stuff anymore? Right. Right. Yeah. With social media and being able to uh, identify employees that way that might be interested in joining. Mm -hmm. And then you can just attach a link, right, to the social media <laughs> post and here's the card to check and, and you're done. Yep. It's absolutely incredible. Yep, the difference that can make. And then I think the last thing that um, I'm interested in, and I've been reading more and more about this, is there are, um, this probably is going to seem obvious to you and our <laughs> listeners, but there are specific industries with employees who worked during COVID and were particularly vulnerable in doing so. Mm -hmm. And healthcare obviously, is a big one. Um, manufacturing, mm -hmm. some retail, mm -hmm. um, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, those are the areas now that are seeing the biggest increase in union yeah. organizing. Even though it feels like we've taken a big step forward as a country from the pandemic, right? Um, I think those feelings are still there with those employees feeling like they went above and beyond in ways that they never dreamed they would be required to do in their job and haven't been right. appreciated or, or thanked for it. Um, and right. so for our listeners that are in those industries, I think there would be a particular vulnerability on top of all of this other yeah. stuff. With I think there is union that, organizing, especially healthcare. I think there is a um, not just a, a lack of, of thanks, but a resentment that was built yeah. with our frontline employees that could not work remotely. Yeah. While frankly, many of their management could, mm -hmm. right? And they were there 
uh, in their view, risking their lives and their families' lives, right? Yeah. While management hit at home. And uh, without you can receiving tell, like, additional pay, town. et cetera. But yeah, it's, just doing their, showing their job. It's not even Showing that. up, doing their it's, job, and, and receiving the same it's pay. It's literally risking their life and yeah. the lives of their yeah. family members, okay. which is more important than pay and benefits and okay. all of all of that. So yes, I do think that bubbling, lingering resentment for those industries is, uh, for is, a lot of folks is, is also real. there. I do. So as we said, lots of lots of different external factors mm -hmm. um, contributing to um, the increase in success in union organizing. Now we need to talk more specifically about one particular factor, and that's what the NLRB is doing, because I also think it's it's just so incredibly important for all employers to understand this right now. Right. Okay. I completely agree. We have all these societal issues, yes. if you will, going but on. But we have the a NLRB legal comes challenge, too. And actually makes it a lot easier. Yeah. So we have the interest in organizing yes. <laughs> going on for all the reasons we talked about, and now we have a mechanism that's to right. organize very effectively That's right. and quickly. That's right. So there's two parts to this, and we're not going to spend a lot of time in detail going through them. I just want to make sure everybody knows what they are. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. The first, the first part is the NLRB's um, new position with regard to when policies, agreements, and handbooks, et cetera, violate the National Labor Relations Act because they could chill an employee's engagement and protected and concerted activities. So let's Can let's I answer stop. this one? You said when to handbooks? When were Always. handbooks? Always. Yes. <laughs> That's the new rule. <laughs> if you want to have rules about workplace conduct, yes. then the, the NLRB, NLRB will, will say be, it's an unfair labor practice. Right. Term. Because almost every type of obnoxious conduct in the workplace could be used in the organizing process, right? Which would be protected. That's exactly right. So the NLRB's new yeah. position is Anything that we tell employees they can't do, okay, if that prohibition might also chill their right to engage in protected and concerted activity, then that's an unfair labor practice, okay? Um, we should probably quickly tell our listeners what concerted and protected activity is. That basically is the protected part is communications or activities uh, that relate to working conditions, mm -hmm. and then the concerted part is for the end of it, for the employee doing that and others. So at right. least one other person has to be concerted. So, so that's not what I protected. was disciplined incorrectly, but I and others are being that's, disciplined incorrectly. That's correct. That's why I'm that's protected concerted activity. So mm -hmm. we're working with a lot of clients who want a review of their policies and their handbooks to try mm -hmm. to address this problem. To your point, though, okay. Um, if you give the NLRB right now a copy of any employer's handbook, employee policy manual, okay, so long as it has rules in it about how employees <laughs> are, what they're allowed to do at work and not, okay, I am telling you the NLRB would find one or two or 10 or 100 places in it that they think would violate the NLRB. So what are employers to do? Well, we'll talk about that in a different podcast. <laughs> Remember how I said we're not going to okay, okay. dive into that? All right. We'll tease people just a little we'll bit. We'll tease people and, and maybe that'll later. be our next one, right? Okay. Um, Good idea. Because there are options there and different businesses are making different decisions about what to do, et cetera. Different risk but levels. The right, point is system. understand that employers are in this position to be committing an unfair, unfair labor practice charge just because they have a handbook with rules. Okay, yeah. that's the okay. first part. The second part is then the NLRB has changed the rules for union elections. Okay, the way it used to work is if a union could get at least half the members, 50% or more of the members of a, of, of a bargaining unit to sign, or to your point, check on a phone, union authorization right. cards, mm -hmm. um, then the union could file a petition for election with the NLRB. Okay. okay. That it. now has changed so that the union, once they get 50% or more employees to sign a card, can then demand recognition from the employer. And then it's the employer's burden to ask the NLRB for an election, and it has to be within two weeks, 
of the union's demand. Okay. Important note. Very quick. Um, that demand could be made to a member of management, any person representing a company. So I have this like fear, this vision of supervisors walking around like with union cards on their clipboard because somebody gave them to the supervisor and they didn't understand what they were. Or print out of a of of the electronic monkey. signatures. Okay. <laughs> But let's just Holy assume okay. the employer then is on top of it. The supervisor understands what's it is, what it is. The employer's on top of it. They do what they need to do and request an election within two weeks after receiving it. Then the NLRB can decide whether an election will be held or whether they're, the NLRB is just going to demand that the union recognize the union and bargain with the union because there's been any unfair labor practice charge. Do you see how so these no two election. things just, the puzzle pieces just click together? No election if the NLRB can find any unfair labor practice. Which could be a handbook. With rules. For instance. <laughs> a handbook with rules. Right? A handbook with rules. <laughs> you got it. So what does that all mean? Once a union gets signatures from 50% of a bargaining unit, it may very well be too late, which means businesses have to be that much farther ahead of all of this. Okay, so we've got a confluence of lots more organizing and employers are in a position in which they may not be able to respond once they realize it's happening. Let's talk about organization. once they realize it's happening, because I yes. think a lot of employers jump once they realize it's happening. But yeah. again, with organizing happening over electronics and yeah. cards, which are not actually cards anymore, right, being done electronically, a lot of employers will not know that no. there's been 50% That's my folks point. that have selected and then it's too late. a union until they are put on notice. Yep. So it is... So what should they Imperative be doing now? Yep. to prepare ahead of time. You you will, oh, it will be the exception when employers are actually aware that organizing yep. is taking place, in my opinion. I think that's a good If point. unions are smart. That's and a good again, way to they're, say. we're working with younger employees now who are yep. very savvy, right? Yeah. It's not, you're not going to, you're going to think someone's texting their spouse or their kid and they're actually texting with a union organizer right. and, and clicking yes. Right. So what should employers be doing now? I think I'll start. <laughs> I talk to a lot of clients and businesses, many, many of which are smaller businesses. And um, they, their, lead, their top leadership has never really even had this conversation. They haven't had to. Right. In I other words, what, how do we feel about this? What is our position with regard to union organizing in our workplace leadership? doesn't know what it is, and certainly the folks who work there, um, both the frontline supervisors and the employees, don't know what it is. So if that's the case, that absolutely is a critical starting place. Yep. Every business needs to know where it stands with regard mm -hmm. to union organizing right now. And then, of course, the next step is that if they're, if they would prefer to remain a union-free workplace, then what is your plan? What is your strategy to do that? Yeah, you have to have a you have to have a plan like an emergency plan ready to go. In addition, your frontline supervisors have to be trained on this. They just have to be. Assuming you want to be union-free, yes, then let's go your down frontline that road, right? supervisors if, if that have to be trained. Choice. Yep. And there's a couple of reasons they have to be trained. Number one, um, again, they, they may have no idea where the organization stands. Right. So they need to know how to respond if asked. Um, they also need to know how not to violate the law. <laughs> when someone talk, engages in protected activity. When against. somebody ga engages in protected <laughs> concerted activity. Right. And the rules in this area are not necessarily common sense, Rebecca. The, right. Where are the lines fall in what you can and cannot do, um, I would not assume that any frontline su supervisor would naturally understand or know where they are. So it's incredibly important that we tell them. And to make it worse, a lot of protected conduct can be conduct that will be 
be offensive to your supervisors, right? Yeah. That they will will appear to be insubordinate or sure. obnoxious, et sure. cetera. Sure. Right. So it's gonna be the right. kind of behavior that could trigger supervisors to react. Sure. And we want the supervisors to know there are some warning signs, right? We want them to be vigilant and have a line of communication to HR or to yeah. top leadership when they see it. We need them to know what to do if they're yeah. given a list of union authorization cards or given the cards themselves, for example, and they don't just put them on their clipboard right. and go on their merry way. And two weeks later, they look down and they're still there and they think, God, I got to figure out what to do with these things. Right? Only got two weeks. Yeah. Right. You got to act fast. So that's, that is a front training of frontline leadership is critical. Right. And it then, really is. and then more broadly, of course, engagement with all of your employees is a huge part of this mm -hmm. as well. Yep. That's the so, best union avoidance. If that is the business's yeah. goal, that's the best avoid, but also that can uh, alert you to when organizing is happening too, right? If sure. you are out there with your employees, you'll be you'll be much more likely to hear things yeah. much earlier. And I like to say, I, I mean, when we often think about employee engagement in general, the focus is more on what, how can we improve the workplace so that people don't leave? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a different question. Okay, when we think about union organizing, we're talking about the people who want to stay. Yeah. The okay. question is, why would they join a union? Yes. Not why would they leave? It's a much different question. Right. And I think it's important for businesses to understand that. So if they think they have done engagement surveys and they understand what makes people stay versus leave, mm -hmm. you really haven't drilled down into employee engagement from a union organizing standpoint. Right. These are the people who want to be with your organization. They want to stay. And, it, and those decisions often come down to a bad supervisor or a discipline that is considered unfair, favoritism, those sorts of yeah. issues, right? Or yeah. why people, well, we'll do but it. they might answer an engagement survey about the organization very positively. Yes, I agree with that because they don't attribute the negative yeah. uh, attributes of their immediate supervisor to the whole organization. So it really yeah. is a different exercise. And of course, it's individual to every organization. So we don't have a recipe today. Um, so, but it, because it's individual, et cetera. So, and the, and the last thing I'll say is, is, is this, because to me, this is just fascinating. I'm seeing more and more businesses um, intentionally educate and train um, hourly employees, non-supervisors about unions. Really? Okay. That is new. I've never so, yeah, because in the past, past, what I would hear in the, I, I would think most businesses feel like, if we talk about it, it's going to come true, right? We don't even <laughs> want to say the word union in our workplace because by doing so, we're right. acknowledging, right, that there could be such a thing <laughs> and it could be interpreted as us somehow encouraging them to do it. I feel like this is sort of like having a sex talk with your teenagers, right? <laughs> um, many businesses have decided look, we can't risk employees signing those cards not understanding what it is. Right. Because once they do, it's potentially too late. And yeah. we don't know what information they're being provided and what they're being told right. when they sign it. Right. And so we, as a business, have decided that education is really important. Well, I think that's all that people need to know for now, although we may have to circle back. On oh, this I think one. we'll be talking about this one right? again probably the rise in the future of, too. The rise yep. of organized labor, the good, the bad, yeah, and the ugly. Exactly. Thank you, Rebecca. Right, thank you. It was fun.